Alexander the Great is one historic name that most people are probably familiar with, but there is much more to his story than a class may have taught in school. And on this podcast, we like to teach you things that you didn't learn in school. For example, Alexander's mother and his father are remarkable in their own rights, both of them paving the way to make their son truly great. And after the legendary king was dead, a civil war broke out that would endure for decades. All that and more, this week on the Gems of History podcast. Let's do this podcasting thing, huh? Huh? Evan, are you ready? Woo, woo, woo. It's very yeah. funny at the website I'm on for sources. Just keeps on showing like the butts of statues. <laughs> now I'm kind of that is questioning getting how, you in the mood. <laughs> yeah, get me in the historical mood. On this week's Gems of History, we're going to go through the historical asses, literally, of history. Ooh. I was thinking, you know what we should do for the YouTube channel is one day we should just sit down and get a bunch of historical figures that we've covered and mm-hmm. get a bulletin board and then do a tier list. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen those where <laughs> it's like S through D. Let's, we should do that with our historical figures. When tears, I don't know what the basis for scoring them would be. but <laughs> That's the best thing because people will get so mad and we just wouldn't tell. Yeah. There would be no basis. It'd just be vibes. Yeah. Just be like, hmm. Yeah. We'll. We'll put Shiro Ishii at like a C. Yeah. It's like, what? <laughs> huh? Honestly, I think that is maybe the most thought, not thought provoking, but rage instilling thing I ever see online. Like people tearing or power ranking cereal. Yeah. Or like other food drives people nuts. Yeah. But gets interaction. That's what we want. Speaking of interaction, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Gems of History podcast. I'm Jacob Shop, your host, and joining me is Evan Roosh. Hey, Freshly engaged. Yes, freshly engaged. Put a ring. I guess it's a, a valid reason to take a week off from the podcast to go get engaged. Yeah, in case anyone was wondering, why does Evan always take off so much? Why isn't he there? Well, sometimes. <laughs> very big Good life-changing reason. things. But yes. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was great. We were in Colorado. And got a beautiful picture of me getting down on the knee and whatnot in front of the, it was at Chautauqua Park in Boulder, Colorado. I believe that's the Flatiron Mountain Range. Couldn't tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, incredible pictures, incredible time. It was, it was perfect. But So did you have a big plan going in or did you just kind of say, hey, I'm just going to ask her at this cool location? Oh, I had a plan. I had a plan going in. But I also, it was very funny on the way there, I checked to make sure I had the ring in my <laughs> pocket so many times and trying to do that with your significant other right next to you in a car and try to be sneaky about it. Very hard. It's like phone, wallet, keys, ring. <laughs> yeah, where I just, phone, wallet, keys, and then also where all my money is Yeah, like with the ring. Yeah, literally <laughs> the most expensive part. Yeah. But that's funny because it's, I don't know if you've ever seen the video where the guy had the engagement ring for his fiance for a while Mm -hmm. and just behind her back would record himself holding it out behind her. And I was like, that is a bold call, first of all. Oh, man. But also the complete opposite of what you did, where he just knew every time he had it. Right. Honestly, I kept it like, not high and tight, but I kept it secure. She's not going to see it. I wore very deep pockets (laughs) or a coat with very deep pockets. But yeah, and she said yes, and now the rest is history. Yeah, that would have been tragic if we started this whole story and it ended with no. <laughs> Can you imagine we just tell the entire story and like, oh yeah, by the way, she said no. She said no. <laughs> tragic. <laughs> yeah, but no, it's it's great. We are very excited and uh, have a date all set and whatnot, and it's it's crazy. That's it's, awesome. It's fun. Moving fast. I like it. Oh yeah. Getting everything set. Good for you guys. Congratulations. Thank you. But are you ready to get back to some? history podcasting i am it's been a full two weeks without doing it so see if i still got it we have quite the story today too so it's gonna i think i think this one's gonna be fun it's another ancient one so i mean as with all ancient stories the sources are all like maybe this happened we're gonna say it did and (laughs) hope this is a very interesting case in where there is quite a bit of history around it like historians covering it we kind of found it with 
Hannibal and Carthage, like compared to other historical stories and historical figures of the BC era, where there is plenty of detail. Like we know Alexander the Great and like his battle formations, right? Like we know like how he went through things, but the dates and like the time, yeah. like all that other stuff, like the classic stuff that gets mixed up is uh, all pretty subjective. But it's very, I just think it's interesting that the great. The great ones get remembered. Yeah, I, but I also think it's funny because Alexander is probably the most controversial mm. figure in, ancient, in the ancient world because people have such biased opinions on how he ruled and if he was actually a good person. Yeah, Because there's so many people that are like, oh, he was so altruistic and he let all these other people into his empire. And others are like, no, he pretty much just subjugated them so that he could use them to rule his empire for him. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah it, is, it is very interesting. But we are covering Alexander the Great, and I've been calling this Alexander the Great from the side. I think, mm-hmm. I think that's a good way to look at it. We are going to be talking about him as a person, but our focus today is going to be more on the people around him, kind mm-hmm. of, as I mentioned in the intro read, his father, his mother, some of the other people that really did shape the way that he grew up and shaped the, the environment around him to set him up to be the great. I think it's a vastly different approach to historical storytelling or recapping. I would say what we traditionally do, where we pick a subject, we pick a person and then tell their story. I really like what we're doing this week and going through all the people who around him who, honestly, after doing the research, made him great. Oh, yeah. Alexander the Great, a very intriguing, very I mean, incredible figure but also had great people around him. Yeah, and if we just covered him, it'd be a lot of, Alexander went here and conquered this people, yeah. and then he went here and conquered this people. He got married somewhere in there. <laughs> then he went here and cut a big rope and proclaimed <laughs> himself God. <laughs> yeah, so and we were trying to avoid kind of that and trying to tell you more of a storyline, because I, in my research, a lot, of source, a lot of more modern sources really are debating, is Philip his father? almost a better general than Alexander was. And Alexander just got the title because he continued what Philip couldn't because he got murdered. Yeah. So, I mean, it is very interesting to see that nobody talks about Philip. But if mm-hmm. Alexander was never in the picture, Philip would have been the great for Macedonia. Yeah. And this is probably the biggest come up for Macedonia. Yeah. And when you think about his- world history, this is their only uh, big shout out. Also... Dan Carlin did some stuff on Alexander the Great, and he calls it Macedonia. So, I've it got ingrained in my mind. So I'm probably going to say either Macedonia or Macedonia, depending on where we are in the story. So, and I will be sticking to Macedonia. Please, please <laughs> correct me because I want to get it. I want to have a singular one, but I know I'm going to mess it up. Yeah, that's All just right. such a Dan Carlin. Thing it is. Too. He loves to do his thing. Should we jump into uh, our our story, though? Let's dive on in. All right. Well, you know, with ancient stories, it's kind of hard to know where to begin because there's a lot of time gaps in historical knowledge for ancient sources. So trying to pick a good starting spot is kind of difficult, especially with someone as big of a name as Alexander the Great, because a lot of people have written a lot of things about him. <laughs> and in this time period, there's always tribes fighting, and there's new big names popping up, but Alexander is one of, if, the, if not the biggest name in the ancient world. Yeah, this Alexander the Great's time period, when he starts his uh, reign of, I don't, can't really say reign of terror, but it's interesting that it's like 330-ish BC, and 100 years before this is when the Battle of Thermopylae happened. So we're kind of talking that same same time period. Yeah, and this is 300 years before official Rome pops up. That's right? not until the end of the, almost the end of the BC period. So yeah. I feel like people get Alexander the Great and Rome switched a lot. Yeah. Like if you're not really into history, you kind of just hear those two names or even think that they're the same thing. Right. Which... It will, I won't spoil anything for like the end of the episode. But. Yeah, but like there is the entirety of the history of America timeline. That's mm-hmm. how long of a distance there is between when Alexander died and when Rome officially took power. So yeah, it's, it's a big time gap in there. That's a really interesting perspective when you put it that way. Yeah, like just how time works. Like that is a long time when I think about this. 
1776. Like that is a long time ago. It is a long time. So some basic background to get us started can be summarized into a few points. Macedonia was a kingdom in the northern part of Greece that was most relevant around the 4th century BCE. The inhabitants supposedly arrived in the area and established the base of what would eventually be known as the Macedonian kingdom around, our best guess is the 7th century BCE. And this happened, and this is my favorite thing about ancient history, is the stories of how places get founded. An oracle (laughs) told the first leader of Macedonia to follow a herd of goats to find their new capital. That, that, I love that. It's just like the Carthage story <laughs> where it's if the amount of string you can put down, or bull hair. Or, it, it was like exactly a, was. a cow hide or Cow something. hide, yeah. yeah. And then they just really milked the cow hide. Well, even Rome itself, it's supposedly Romulus and Yeah, two his kids twin. that got raised by a wolf. Ways, so. Yeah, exactly. So it's, you have, to, you have to respect these types of things. It's so much fun. Yeah. And Massa, it's just very interesting, the culture there too. Like sheep obviously played a huge part. And it was a huge food source for the Macedonia, if I'm not mistaken, is very mountainous. Yeah. So there's not a ton of land to raise crops. Even Greece in, a, in, its, in and of itself is very mountainous. Yeah. And like Sparta, it was very mountainous and they just found the one area that was good that they could settle in. So. Right. Right. So it was around this time that the people in Macedonian areas began to refer to themselves as Greeks and started speaking Greek language, worshiping Greek gods. However, the southern Greek tribes, like the Athenians, viewed the Macedonians as barbarians, uh, people that couldn't even produce good slaves and were just as likely to fist fight at a philo- philosophical debate as they were to intellectually discuss matters of the mind. Can you imagine that being a burn? Like, your country can't even produce good slaves. Like, oh my God. Thank you. Like, <laughs> people are like, man, if only there was a social network where we could get these guys yeah, and right. take them off their platform. Exactly. But this supposed barbarian people would eventually produce two consecutive rulers that would come to rule the largest empire in the known world at that time. And the transition from that herding and hunting tribe to a metropolis and an imperial power is honestly insanely quick. And that's all thanks, basically, to Philip II. Yeah. I mean, at the end of Alexander's death, it comes to be known as the Hellenistic period, which is a time of great cultural, I guess you don't want to say revamp, but re reinvent invigorating it just gets like jump started yeah it's almost an upheaval of like everything right. that happened before they kind of realize hey yeah. we got to be civilized <laughs> a right. little more at least i mean aristotle to again put this in perspective the timeline aristotle lived during alexander the great's reign and produced some of his greatest philosophical thoughts during the reign of alexander the great yeah there's so, a lot of big names that pop up in this story and i think that's why alexander is such a studied person mm-hmm. just because there's so many other huge names that influence him so it's kind of a big deal. <laughs> it is It is very cool. Like this time period just being so well documented. Yeah. Again, compared to other time, other BC time periods, it is very interesting. And when we say well documented, as for my sources for this, I read a book on Olympias, who is Alexander's mother. It's by Elizabeth Carney. It's called Alex, or, uh, Olympias, the Mother of Alexander the Great. It's a very good book, like research wise. It's kind of dry, mm-hmm. but it's, it's very good research wise. But it's so funny because there's at least five or six sources that recount the same stories about her, about Alexander in this time period, but all of them are just wildly different recountings of yeah. it. And there's yeah. like one little thread that's the same, but everything else is just wildly different. It's that classic game of historical telephone. Yeah, and where you are in the world and what time period, so. Oh yeah, very it's true. It's telephone through time. Through <laughs> In the mid-300s BCE, Macedonia was ruled by Philip's father, whose name was Perdiccas III. And during this time of Perdiccas's rule, Philip spent his younger years learning to hunt, ride, and fight, while also focusing on education, like poetry and politics. So, in this barbaric world, they were educated. Yeah. It, it's just that they were from the north and looked a little different than the southern Greeks. Yeah, it's not the traditional, like, hot greeks right? you're, it's not those athen like athenians yeah. who are just very book smart and ooh democracy and such or spartans where they have the cgi apps yeah, right i'm actually picturing macedonians as just 
Wisconsin, like people from the Midwest. Yeah, like, <laughs> like mo- almost like mountain, mountain men looking. Yeah, yeah they're not the like uh, some beer guts, but can also <laughs> lift like a hay bale the entire day. <laughs> oh, hay. they're yeah. the they're the strong men guys, not like the bodybuilder guys. They they're have the guys dad with strength. the guts. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> their entire center of gravity is just their gut. <laughs> Philip grew up with a distinct understanding of how power was displaced in Macedonia because it was really no surprise in this culture to see a child in the royal cur- in the royal courts get murdered as a power play by rivals to the throne. It happened a lot. It definitely happened post Alexander yeah, the Great. A lot. We won't get into that too much, but wow, was there a lot and of it, murder? It was just accepted as a norm. So he understood that at a young age that he had to really look out for himself if he wanted to survive. Mm-hmm. He observed and learned from all of this and concluded that violent, unstable, and hyper-masculine society in Macedonia was the norm, and it needed to be guided by a ruthless hand if one wanted to have a respected rule. And soon after turning 20, the young Philip would be able to test that theory firsthand when his brother died fighting against Macedonia's eternal rival, the Illyrians. Mmm, the Illyrians, yeah. They come up quite a bit in this story. Since Perdiccas III only had a small child as his heir, Philip, his brother, was appointed to rule Macedonia as regent, or a stand-in for the throne until the heir is old enough. And in short order, Philip was pretty much able to officially declare himself the sole ruler of Macedonia. I don't really know what happened to the kid. I'm pretty sure he survived. I don't think, I don't think Philip killed him, but it didn't really say. So he just kind of took control. Another, it's the classic parallel throughout different cultures i mean this same thing happened with the sengoku hide in japan where there was a child after the emperor <clears throat> after the initial emperor died tokugawa hideyoshi i believe died and they were like we're gonna everyone wait for 18 <laughs> years for this person to become old enough to uh ascend the throne and then uh, everyone else was like actually we're adults <laughs> we can run this we can do this <laughs> that happens in this story too for mm-hmm. sure an archaeologist named angeliki kodar kotaridi who has spent decades working on ancient macedonian macedonian restoration sites said of philip quote He inherited a very old-fashioned tribal kingdom with an economy based on livestock. He brought new ideas from Greece. He introduced coinage. He turned this city, meaning the religious city of a guy, into a political functioning space. And he completely revolutionized the military. End quote. In quick succession, Philip instituted reforms that would completely flip Macedonia's hunter-gatherer society on its head. The military aspect, and are you are we gonna just are you just about to dive? We're in? just about to get to it. Okay, I will pause before <laughs> I go into a few fun facts. So before Philip, the kingdom had no standing army, and instead had volunteers and synons that it relied on for its military fighting, and that was similar in most Greek city states. So Philip decided to change that. He instituted a wage for the soldiers, better training, new weapons, promotional structuring, so people could ascend through the ranks of the military. And he introduced cash or land bonuses from conquered territories. So he pretty much changed the entire way that the military operated. And he introduced the longer pike or spear weapons that they used and restructured the known phalanx formation, which is basically, if you don't know what that is, a bunch of men organize into a giant block formation in rows. And then they hold those long spears at varying heights so that you have a point at pretty much every level so that you, no matter if someone tries to jump it over or anything you you're gonna get them yeah it's very 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 smart to keep your enemy far away from you with a long pointy stick so you can't get charged at the phalanx typically you would just short shuffle until you get yep. to, <laughs> to get i mean you can't get hit by arrows because everyone has a shield like that type of stuff and with the army revamp like you mentioned those reforms basically saying hey you can get paid for this yeah and also when we conquer people you can have their land i mean the numbers jumped from roughly and these are of course estimates they jumped from 10,000 to 24,000 yeah like standing professional army and then the cavalry which i think is the most impressive part 600 to 3500 yeah and so when you're coupling trained soldiers who really can't take much damage in a phalanx formation Combined with a professional cavalry force, 
being able to charge and I mean the, the Macedonian cavalry in their battles with the Persians performs extremely yeah. well because they have armor and we'll get into that later. But the focus on military reform and making that natural aggression that Macedonians had at this time into more focused aggression and paying them to do it. Yeah. Definitely reaped benefits here. It is interesting too, because this is probably one of the first instances of a structured wage in a military, because I know in medieval France in like the 1400s, when the hundred years war and stuff is going Mm -hmm. on, France just introduces a paid military wage for their army in that time period. So there's a long gap where it's basically just like another unpaid military of standing people who decide to sign on to support the country. It's not even that they're getting paid for it. That is it's, crazy. It, That's Yeah, they just relied on what they got from plunder. So huh. it's weird seeing it this early on, and then it just strays away from it for two millennia almost. But with this new structured military, Philip wasn't just teaching these men how to fight. He was leading them into battle on horseback, as was tradition for these Greek kings. He wore his multiple war wounds proudly, later boasting a missing eye, a maimed hand, and a limp from a leg wound. He symbolically inspired the Macedonians to be the best. And I guess it made sense for a people who claimed to have descended from Heracles or Hercules and Zeus to be fierce fighters. And as Evan mentioned, the numbers just jumped exponentially. And with those larger numbers, the Macedonian army tore through Greece and showed the neighboring city-states that Macedonia wasn't just a barbaric horde, but also it was a well-organized kingdom with large ideas of grandeur. The army even wore uniforms and pledged their loyalty solely to the king, which was interesting for the time period. Yeah, that was something that was instituted by Philip, and Alexander, of course, kept that same thing where everyone, every single soldier, even when they conquered like the Persians, like has to swear fealty to the king. Yeah, and the uniforms thing, that's the thing that Sparta did. Mm -hmm. They did the red shields and stuff just to look like a unified fighting force to intimidate the enemy. Before fighting, they were like, ooh, we look good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I remember even playing sports and being in uniforms. It's like, all right, boys, we're kind of like, we have a fit going on there, right here. And then we go play eighth grade hoops. <laughs> yeah. But there is something to be said about just a uniform block like that. Whereas yeah. if you're just a bunch of tribes gathered together to fight, there's no really cohesion there. But seeing an intimidating unified force like that, it's, it's very intimidating to see mm-hmm. that. Oh, definitely. In addition to his amazing military organization, Philip was also a shrewd political mind. He knew that he couldn't control everyone around him just through intimidation, so Philip reorganized the capital city of Pella and made it into a place for philosophers and education, and used it as a way to invite foreign royalties children into Macedonia under the auspices of teaching them. And this also gave him royalties children from other places, so that's a big bargaining ship to just hold. (laughs) Even royals liked their children to not be harmed. It's a very crazy concept when we, based on some of the stories that we've talked about even on the show, but having them there definitely helps. It helps. Eventually, as the southern Greek city-states began to weaken themselves through constant civil war and foreign wars, Macedonia slowly rose to the top of the heap. And throughout all the fighting and infrastructure reform, Philip also showed his keen foreign policy understanding by marrying not once, not twice, but seven times. So as someone that just got engaged... Yeah, you want to do that do you six think, more times? Do, no, no. <laughs> Big fan of the one. The one, yeah, I think that's good. <laughs> but also, do you think he's just using government... It just makes me laugh a lot, like using government money to buy seven rocks. <laughs> Seven I don't think these wives are getting big rings. No. <laughs> I mean, maybe a couple of them. Yeah, Olympia maybe like, specifically, but... Right, maybe like from plunder. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, now, fiance, I did not plunder. <laughs> I did not, you didn't I did take not, over a Greek city-state n- to no, get I your didn't, ring? I didn't sack Athens. <laughs> Man, men used to go to war and sack <laughs> cities to get rings, and then we just buy it from... Buy it from, from Kay's Jew- Jewelers. Yeah. <laughs> So Philip married warrior princesses, domestic Macedonians, and most importantly, he married the princess of a place known as Epirus or Epirus. 
This noble daughter of the Epirote king was named Olympias, and she would later give birth to one of the most important men in antiquity. Olympias was Philip's fourth or fifth wife, originally born with the birth name of Myrtle, later known as Polex- Polexena, and eventually Olympias. And she was born into the ruling family of Epirus, which was located just southwest of Macedonia proper. She had a few name changes throughout the years, this a few is actually, rebrands. This is actually a very interesting thing that uh, Elizabeth Carney talked about in her book, and I didn't, I never knew this, but the reason that they made name changes was it signified big life-changing events for them. Mm. So she started her life probably as Myrtle. That was one that she probably chose for herself, and then probably had a coming-of-age ceremony is what she guessed. She changed to Polyxena. And then once she got married, or shortly after getting married to Philip, there's a reason for her change to Olympias. Hmm. So I thought that was really interesting. It basically could be like, once we graduate high school, we change our name. And then once we get married, we change our name again. That's kind of fun. It is. Keep, I think, things, keep things interesting. I mean, you're you know? also back in the time where everyone has like three names. So Right, yeah. And so, like one of them is based off your hometown. Yeah, basically. So Epirus, or Melosia, which is where she was specifically from, was a rural backwater for all intents and purposes in Greece. It was a very mountainous counterpart to the urban centers of the south, like Athens. However, Olympias came from a people who also claimed a divine ancestry, similar to the Macedonians, saying that they were descended from a son of Achilles. And since women were the religious strength of most of the ancient Greek communities, Olympias is believed to have been particularly active in that role, as we will see later in her life, by her devotion to the god Dionysus. By the time she was around 16 or 18, depending on where we place her birth, Olympias was technically an orphan with no surviving parents, And it's not really known how Philip came to know Olympias around this time, but our best report says that they met on an island off the coast of Macedonia known as Samothrace. The uh, Greek writer Plutarch gives a very, let's say, Hollywood version of their meeting of events. Quote, After Philip had been initiated on Samothrace along with Olympias, he fell passionately in love with her, and although he was only a young adult and she was an orphan, he went right ahead and betrothed himself to her, end quote. Oh, so starstruck from the very beginning. (laughs) Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet, yeah, the son of uh, Hercules and someone that loves the god of wine. Yeah, right. Dionysus. (laughs) Or what's a movie where like a rich guy finds a poor girl and falls in love with her? Is this the cat? Is this is this what the movie Pretty Woman is based off of? I it very well could be. Dang, I also thought that I don't know. (laughs) I don't think I've ever seen Pretty Woman, so I cannot say. Basically, rich to sum up Pretty Woman. This is movie talk of the Gems of History podcast. It's rich guy uh, falls in love with the um sex worker that he sees yep it's that except I don't except think she, she wasn't not a sex, sex worker, worker so <laughs> not, a, not the best she's analogy. just an orphan from the mountains <laughs> it's just an orphan from the mountains yeah however in her book on olympias elizabeth carney refutes that it happened so romantically saying quote even ordinary greeks did not marry for for romantic love the prime purpose of marriage was the procreation of children and virtually all marriages were arranged end quote so Doubtful that it happened so romantically for them. It wasn't under starry nights on the coast of the ocean. Yeah, no, it's very funny because Samothrace is this very isolated island at this time. Oh, <laughs> that's just used for religious ceremonies, and Elizabeth Carney calls the people that use it for religious ceremonies a cult. <laughs> so it's yeah, like, the cult of Dionysus. Yeah, yeah, so it's just a cult island, pretty much. And she's like, I don't think she would have gone here normally. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. So the it it. Probably was the fact that there was movements in motion beforehand that brought Olympias and Philip to this remote island at the same time. And it was certainly almost because Olympias was another bargaining chip to help an alliance between two Greek city-states at the time, being Macedonia and Epirus. Right, right. It is kind of funny now that you think about it. Like, Philip had seven wives, right? And he just conquered Greece. Yeah. Like, imagine if he would have done, like, the Alexander the Great type 
land expansion and got to India. Oh, God. We we're probably talking Solomon numbers. Double, double digits, <laughs> we're for talking, sure. Triple digits. <laughs> oh, I, would, no. I, honestly, I honestly think hey, we're man. talking Solomon numbers. He Well, he had plenty of concubines, so if you count those, I'm sure it was probably like 40. Yeah, I'm sure but, this man wasn't faithful. No, not at all. <laughs> but yeah, this is an alliance between Macedonia and Epirus because they both wanted to defeat the Illyrians. Yep. The, the Illyrian menace. <laughs> the GD Illyrians, yeah. So the circumstances around Olympias may have been different than other wives for Philip, with Olympias' guardian perhaps agreeing to the alliance with the promise that she would hold a higher preference within the structuring of the wives for Philip. She was an A tier. Yeah, <laughs> she, she got to the S tier on the, the list. S tier, but, yeah. But she, she was like contending for the S tier with like one other person. Hmm. But in the end, her role was to produce an heir and to unify the Molossians and the Macedonians. However, Olympias wouldn't identify as a Macedonian after her marriage, because according to Elizabeth Carney, Greek women were never officially part of their husband's household. Rather, it was more that they were loaned to that husband's family, and then once she produced children, those children became part of the husband's family. And this meant that for someone in Olympias's position, the best chance she had to secure herself safety in the royal courts was to bear a strong male heir. That is kind of crazy that marriage was basically just leasing out yeah, a person. Pretty much. To put it in very layman's terms. It I would is. Say. It's like getting a lease on a car and you get another car from the lease. Yeah, and you get an, <laughs> and you uh, have to raise that car. <laughs> <laughs> it's like buying a truck and you also get like a mini Cooper. <laughs> so you get <laughs> a one few of those years left, <laughs> nine months later. <laughs> you get a power wheels with it. You oh have to God. build it into an actual you car. Have to, yeah. yeah. So this the child that Olympias would have would help tie her into Philip's family officially and then help solidify some protection around her in the royal courts. And in her own right, Olympias was also very clever when it came to palace intrigue and knew how to weave herself into those positions of power. And it also helps that she did eventually give birth to Alexander, soon to be known as the Great. <laughs> Not a bad, not a bad Mini Cooper, not a bad Power Wheels or <laughs> yeah. whatever to pop out. <laughs> that is a very good bargaining chip to have in your corner when you're not part of the family. How many times do you think she told Philip that I just gave birth to a god? Yeah, seriously. And I, then she really had to reiterate it to both Alexander and Philip. Right. And it's interesting because as a wife, she almost had less, I don't want to say autonomy, but mm. like she had less uh, I guess autonomy is the right word, mm -hmm. but because in Melosia, widows could, sh I like they could own property, they could make decisions for themselves, and they couldn't have another arranged marriage set for them. It was only the one, pretty much, that they had, and then after that, they're free to choose who they wanted to marry for some for most people. Obviously, yeah. for royals, it's probably going to be you're marrying someone. Mm -hmm. but. So, according to Plutarch, quote. On the night before they were to be locked into the bridal chamber together, the bride had a dream in which, following a clap of thunder, her womb was struck by a thunderbolt. This started a vigorous fire which then burst into flames and spread all over the place before dying down. End quote. <laughs> Can you... <laughs> her, her womb was struck by lightning. <laughs> Ta-da! Ta-da! <laughs> And I don't now think with that, jazz hands I don't, came I'm, Alexander the Great. I'm not super versed on childbearing, but I feel like lightning to the womb probably doesn't help. As a man, yes. I do not know. I don't, I just, this is an assumption. Yes, I assume based on, I mean, just watching like an episode of Grey's Anatomy, it's not a there isn't flame that <laughs> spreads across the yeah, wildlands. I don't think going to a fertility doctor right now is going to have a list of options and one of them being strike by lightning. Right. <laughs> like, oh, you want the struck by lightning and flames engulf here to Asia option. Okay. Let me just jot that down. That's going to be $30 million. Yep. <laughs> and 500 war elephants. But yeah, so this is the dream that Olympias apparently had on the night before she slept with Philip for the first time. And in addition to Olympias' dream, Philip said that he had one in which he pressed a seal of a lion onto his new wife's womb. So, lightning, seal of a lion, Alexander the Great. Lightning lion. Alexander the Great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it seems as though destiny had foretold their son's legendary life before he was even born. 
And on July 20th, 356 BCE, Alexander was indeed born. On the day of his birth, more good omens seemed to mark his life. Philip received news that his commander had won a decisive battle against the dreaded Illyrians. Not only that, but his racehorse had won at the Olympic Games, which is most likely where Olympias is believed to have gotten her name from. And on top of both of those, Alexander was born. This man's on a hot streak. That's a that's a th- three strikes and you're in, buddy. That's a solid, solid hot streak. You, like, you don't leave the blackjack table on this yeah, type of right. hot streak. <laughs> you got a new name for your wife, yep. a new son, and you've got new conquered territory. That's a lot of new things you got. And your horse won, yeah. Yeah. So apparently, this was all rumored to mean that Alexander was going to be invincible, which is big shoes for a baby to fill. (laughs) Yeah, and he came out saying, goo goo gaga. Yeah, so these good omens were just what Olympias, and by extension, her new son Alexander, needed in this uncertain Macedonian court. As I mentioned earlier, Macedonian succession was a very up-in-the-air tradition, since rulers were dying and being replaced quite often. And with Olympias likely being Philip's fourth or fifth wife, having a strong young boy put her far ahead of the other competition in the standings for who would inherit the throne. Because Philip did have one other son, but by all accounts, this other son unfortunately developed some type of mental handicap, and by the time he would have been old enough to rule, wasn't fit for it. On the other hand, Alexander showed promise at quite an early age. He was originally taught by a man known as Leonidas. I don't think he's related to the Thermopylae guy. Guessing not. Uh, This guy was a relative of Olympias, and he taught Alexander how to ride and how to fight. And in these early years, Olympias and Leonidas instilled instilled in Alexander the idea of his heroic heritage. Leonidas would call himself by the nickname of Phoenix, which was apparently the name of Achilles' tutor, and he referred to Alexander himself as Achilles. That's not bad. So you like, could see why when he gets on campaign, he's like, I am a god. It's fair. I'm just picturing Olympias yelling at Alexander the Great, like your mom like moms just typically do, including your middle name, and that's when you know it's serious. But they just they've just stacked every single Greek hero. <laughs> so Alexander, Achilles, Zeus, Heracles, <laughs> Diet or not Dionysus, uh Odysseus. Time for dinner. <laughs> the great. Yeah, Get over the here. Great at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Alexander would also have had teachers to educate him on reading and writing, eventually getting the best money could buy, so to speak, because Alexander joined a small group of students to study under Aristotle, supposedly learning everything from politics to zoology. However, his youth would have been much more focused on military training overall, with Aristotle just kind of being the, I guess, the garnish to his main meal. It's, a, it's almost like saying that you went to Harvard. Yeah. Like having that on your resume or pretty much. whatever, like getting a degree from Aristotle. Pretty, pretty good. Yeah, it's like saying that you went, or no, saying like, I went to Harvard and graduated with a master's, but also went to Oxford and got a side degree somewhere and something else. Right, right. Yeah. Alexander did retain a love of nature and science, though, and when Aristotle gave his own annotated copy of the Iliad to Alexander, the young royal carried it with him on his eventual journey across Asia, which is pretty big. Could you imagine if they ever found that book, like how much it would be worth? Oh my gosh. I mean, they found his son's tomb, but they have never found his because, I mean, a lot of stuff happens after he dies. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of stuff. So one of the most enduring stories to show Alexander's prowess as a young man was the story of Bucephalus. So this was the story about a horse that was said to be untamable, with nobody being able to calm down the crazy steed. However, Alexander realized that the horse was apparently just spooked by its own shadow, and he was able to shift the horse's gaze and calm it down enough to ride it. That's very funny. <laughs> and this is what showed that he was going to be a great man. This, yeah. <laughs> Alexander, like these horse trainers probably have been doing this forever. They're just stumped. <laughs> and then this child is just saying, don't let it see the shadow. Can you yeah. imagine being told that? <laughs> You're just like, oh, hand to the forehead, like, guys, we cannot let this keep happening. <laughs> yeah. Great. Now he thinks he's a god again. Yeah. So this was said to be the turning point to truly show Philip what his young son was capable of. 
But at the same time, Olympias was also imprinting on Alexander as well. Through whatever means, Alexander began to identify more with his mother's heroic background rather than his father's, which is surprising for the time. And in addition, at the age of only 16, Philip placed Alexander in the position of regent for Macedonia. Philip at this point had enough trust in his son to rule while he was on campaign. And while on this campaign, it was said that Philip erected statues not only of his parents, but also of Alexander and Olympias, basically solidifying his line of succession through his son. So he was definitely playing favorites at this point. Goodbye, yeah. six other wives and other child. This is definitely the road that they're going down. Right. I mean, he didn't really have too much of an option at this point. Right. You have a mentally handicapped son who isn't really fit to rule on his own, so you're going to have to have a regent anyways. Yeah. Or you have a guy that's your direct bloodline that's being taught by Aristotle and taming horses that are scared. I was about to say, and, and, and tame the horse. <laughs> yeah, so, which one? Right. It's, it's a toss up. <laughs> Flip the coin. Yeah. That's why he introduced coinage. That's so why he, he could so flip a coin. That's how he made all of his decisions. Like, thank, he, he was just no sacred chickens, it, just coins. Yeah, instead of like heads or tails, what do you think they did? Like the picture of my face or the not picture of my yeah, face it's, on it's the coin? Perdiccas or me? Yeah, <laughs> you look the same. Olympias would continue to sell her son that it was his right to rule, but deep down she knew that at any moment Philip could decide differently or another rival to the throne could take her and her son out, which was a paranoia that she would pass on to her son. Which I think is fair. I mean, you're living in a royal system where at any moment you and your promising heir to the throne could just be assassinated and no one would really bat an eye at it just and, another day and everyone would just say that's a wednesday i feel like a lot of assassinations would happen on a wednesday hump day yeah it's a rough or a monday yeah <laughs> just get it out of the way oh, mondays <laughs> <laughs> but aside from this we really know relatively little about alexander's boyhood and the story kind of picks up once he turns 18 because that's when he began to show his true military prowess by turning the tides of battle and campaigns against the allied Greek city-states that his father was campaigning against. But despite this rise in reputation for the already heralded Alexander, his relationship with Philip was kind of hitting a rough patch, and it apparently came to a head when Philip married his final wife, one of the multiple Cleopatras in this story, because Olympias also had another child, which was also named Cleopatra. Oh, so... None of them are the Cleopatra. The Cleopatra. <laughs> At the wedding, Cleopatra, who is Philip's new wife, her uncle Attalus, who is one of Philip's commanders, made a remark about Alexander being only half Macedonian, saying, quote, now, at any rate, genuine, not bastard kings will be born. End quote. Ooh. It's throwing shade at Alexander pretty hard. And you can't say that at, at this time. It's very much a diss. But he gets away with it pretty easily for yes. some reason. Yeah. <laughs> at this remark, Alexander threw his cup at Attalus, who responded by throwing his cup at Alexander. Alexander then verbally reprimanded his father who was too drunk to walk across the room and had failed to defend his son and heir's honor. And adding to the embarrassment, Philip attempted to draw his sword not against Attalus, but against Alexander. Lucky for Alexander, though, Philip was way too drunk and stumbled and fell. Oof. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> Talk I about guess. a bad look. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and also, he doesn't have... And he has a eye, yeah. singular eye. He has a limp. And a maimed hand. <laughs> and a maimed hand. He's trying to swing a sword drunk. Like, can you imagine if someone this would, go get their dad? Can you imagine if this is how he would have died? Like, he just fell, fell on, on his sword, sword drunk at a party after he tried to attack his son who just got insulted. Who just got <laughs> yeah, a wine cup thrown at that him. That would be a bad look. Mm -hmm. But after this event, Alexander grabbed his mother and set her back up in her homeland while Alexander himself stayed with the dreaded Illyrians, which is very interesting. I don't really know why he does that, but... Maybe just to piss off Philip. I think he kind of does, yeah. <laughs> so things were very sour, but they had been tense between Olympias and Philip for a time before this anyways. And I mean, the only reason why they only had two kids is apparently because Philip walked in on her in a bed with a bunch of snakes because of her devotion to Dionysus. So I guess that's a bit off-putting for a marriage. In the Alexander, the 2004 Alexander the Great movie, 
I believe this is one of the scenes, and it's Angelina Jolie. Yeah. <laughs> Very funny. It's just super attractive woman in yeah. bed with a bunch of snakes. With snakes. Like, what? Yeah, that's probably a tall tale, but I mean, it just kind of shows that there was a bit of a, a terse relationship between the two, at least in a sexual way. Like, they didn't sleep together anymore. And that's probably why he had yeah. a seventh wife. Right. He's just thinking, she just keeps on bringing snakes to the bed. <laughs> so, so I'm weird. trying to bring a snake to the bed. Ayo. Ooh. Things took a little time, but eventually the relationship was somewhat smoothed over. Philip agreed to marry his and Olympias's daughter, Cleopatra, to the ruler of Melosia, who was Olympias's brother, who was also named Alexander. Can you see why things get really confusing? <laughs> Very fast, yes. So, basically, he was mar- Philip was marrying off his daughter to her uncle as a symbolic gesture to smooth over relations between Olympias's people and the Macedonians. Also, ew. Is that more clear? <laughs> yes, but also <laughs> ew. Very ick. Yes. Very ick. <laughs> so this benefited Philip, obviously, who would now be able to show his repaired family situation to the public. And it also did benefit Olympias, who proved that she and Alexander were not weak people who would go to Philip to beg for an apology to be let back into the courts. They showed their resolve by leaving. Mm-hmm. Philip arranged for the wedding to be a large public affair. He had a crowd gathered at the amphitheater, walked out to a large applause amongst a host of statues of gods and himself, and just as soon as the festivities had begun, Philip was stabbed through the heart. And just like that, Philip II of Macedonia was dead. Got a big old knife in the heart, yeah. Yeah. And, and it, he did not fall down, just to make that clear. <laughs> he did not yeah, fall down. Yeah, it wasn't a, st- a drunk stumble. No. But he had this huge festival planned and he was trying to show his kingliness and his like almost his godliness by yeah. coming out amongst all these statues of gods and himself and not wearing armor. He just said, this is the one time in public appearance that he pretty much didn't wear armor. Cause he's like, I don't need it. I'm basically a God. Nothing can happen to me. And then he gets stabbed. <laughs> that will teach you. And I mean, Alexander, the, Alexander the great is very paranoid throughout his entire his entire life, to Fair. be quite honest, of assassinations. Like, that's what he's grown up with. His dad just got stabbed in the heart, so... Yeah, it's, uh, it's a big turning point in Alexander and Olympias' life, to say the least. Hey, we're going to be talking about sexual assault in a minute. The murder of Philip was carried out by a jilted ex-lover and bodyguard of Philip, whose name was Pausanias. Apparently, Philip had Pausanias replaced by another man, who was also named Pausanias. So Pausanias I made a remark about Pausanias II being too feminine. So to prove that he was brave, Pausanias II died in battle on purpose to shield Philip. And as he died, Pausanias II told Attalus, that dude who insulted Alexander at the wedding, that he wanted to make sure Pausanias I knew how hurt his feelings were. Oh, <laughs> was it worth it? <laughs> just, just for being called like... I don't know, a sissy. You, f- you field fairy. Like, yeah. and- oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you jump in front of a sword. So you for jump your in king. front. Yeah. <laughs> Philip is like, God, I'm going to lose my other hand. Yeah. <laughs> so Attalus then took it upon himself to get Pausanias one extremely drunk at a dinner and then handed him over to his stable workers to be gang raped. Jesus. Yeah. This is a very rough point in the story. I didn't. I probably should have put a warning on that part. (laughs) Retroactive. Hey, we're going to be talking about sexual assault in a minute. All right. I'll throw that back. (laughs) There we go. So Pausanias 1 was obviously very upset about this turn of events and went to Philip for justice. But Philip didn't really do anything because Attalus was one of his good commanders. He didn't really want to get in bad standing with him. And this was apparently the reasoning for Pausanias' murderous actions against the king of Macedonia. And after stabbing Philip, Pausanias attempted to flee to some waiting horses, but tripped on a vine and was killed. That is so Greek. It is, yeah. Like tripped on a tripped on an olive oil vine or it's something like that. The dumbest thing in the world. You, that is kind of crazy. Like he just kind of pulled. He literally just pulled the John Wilkes Booth. Yeah. And except didn't get away with it. I mean, he had a 
getaway car, getaway horses. Like yeah, they yeah. were ready to go. So he um, he could have gotten away with this. He's probably seeing daylight. He's had this planned. It's like the heist movie where they just are just about to get, get away with it and then falls on leaf. See, we, falls had, on we had different visions. I was thinking of the hot rod scene where he's dancing in the forest <laughs> and then falls down the hill. I was thinking that. <laughs> he's, he's just dancing, celebrating, stabbing a king in the heart. Yeah, and then he trips out of vine and gets stabbed. <laughs> Now, obviously, a public murder of a king is a very big deal, and people began to talk about the possibility that Pausanias wasn't working alone. And who better to point the finger at than the now king of Macedonia and his mother, who just returned from exile? Very conveniently timed. Yes. Rumors had begun to spread to say that Olympias and Alexander helped to mastermind the murder, but the evidence is pretty slim to non-existent to support that claim. And while they did benefit from this the most, so did a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Persians got another two years before the planned invasion of Philip would come to fruition through Alexander. Pausanias himself got his revenge. And like I mentioned earlier, Macedonian kings were just always candidates for another royal family to just up and kill one day. So it wasn't that surprising. So who knows? I mean, maybe they did have a hand in it, but regardless, Philip's dead now and Alexander and by extension, his mother Olympias were now in charge. That's definitely a theme of this entire story of the Hellenistic period, because post Alexander the Great, like we mentioned, a lot of stabbings happening, a lot of poisoning happening, and it's all very Game of Thronesy, where it's who did it, it and is, now who's going to send the throne. Yeah, it is very, very Game of Thronesy, uh, and I mean, uh, the, I think if anything, the Persians probably put them up to this the most i mean they yeah. knew that he was coming and so what better way than to stall that than get rid of him i know buy yourself an entire two years that's two more years of training for your army two years of fortifying things definitely helps well and you're just throwing chaos into an environment that's already chaotic so. right i mean the entire government could have been destabilized if it wasn't for olympia right. and, and alexander or athens could have done it you know any yeah. of the greek city states that got taken over once Philip was dead, Alexander inherited a very turbulent kingdom, and he spent the next two years trying to stabilize his already shaky power in Macedonia. But he did do well. In addition to just killing a bunch of Macedonians who he perceived as a threat to his rule, Alexander also quashed a rebellion from the Illyrians and other rivals of the Macedonians. Very funny that was the Illyrians again. It's always the Illyrians. Yeah, Alexander just came back and thought, I thought we were boys. Dude, he just went around killing everybody. Yeah, he got rid of a lot of political enemies, political opponents, anyone that had a claim. Yeah, so it, it's a very strong statement to make when you take over and just immediately start killing people. Hacking and slashing. Yeah. One of the Macedonians Alexander targeted was Attalus, whom he had killed on campaign for the charge of planning a revolt. I mean, he could have been doing that, maybe. It does seem like a very Attalus thing. Yeah, I mean, maybe he set up Pausanias to be mad at Philip so that he could set up a revolt. Right. You know, there's right. a lot of different people that would benefit. Then Alexander, Alexander just said, it actually doesn't sound great when it said Pausanias the yeah. Great. It doesn't have a good it, ring it, to it. It's not the same. But while Alexander was killing a bunch of people, his mother was also off doing her own thing to help her position as well. Olympias is said to have killed off Philip's last wife and Attalus's niece, Cleopatra, by sending her a rope to hang herself with. And she also had Cleopatra's daughter killed too, which isn't as fun. I guess that I guess sending a rope to someone to hang themselves isn't fun either. Holy but cow, that's a, that's a move. Yeah, she's like, I don't like you. I never liked you. Here you go. Go for it. <laughs> I believe she also used a lot of poison. In oh, her day. a like lot she, of yeah. She loved. She loved snakes. Yeah, I she think. I think this is the. It's either this woman or a woman we'll get to later that she is claimed to have sent her a poison vial, like hemlock mm -hmm. and a rope, or like a dagger, hemlock and a rope, and said, "Here, take your pick. Oh Spin my God. the wheel." <laughs> Ugh. But this move not only got rid of a public enemy for the new ruler, but also secured Alexander's and Olympias' positions against two challengers to the throne who had already begun to show themselves to be hostile to Alexander. But, as I mentioned, this was pretty normal for the time, so no one really cared. <laughs> yeah. Again, another Tuesday. Yeah. 
After settling things at home, Alexander quickly moved to pursue pursue the plan that his father had set in place before he died, which was to invade and conquer the Persian Empire. And he did this so quickly, in fact, that he didn't even take the time to get married until he was in the middle of his campaign in Asia, despite some of his commanders suggesting that he do it earlier. And this is a suggestion he probably should have taken them up on. Yeah, he definitely should have taken them up on this. It was, even if it was just one, you just need like a wife, establish a line, establish an heir, all that great stuff. Would have saved a lot of headache and history would have been a lot different. Just take two months get married get some you time get married get her pregnant then you can leave like that that is all you literally all you have to do to to establish an heir like that is all they wanted him to do you know that's an incredible sound bite without context oh yeah (laughs) don't do that every guy out there do that now yeah But, but like speaking from their perspective, that's like all they needed him to do so that they could have a line of succession. Right. Like have a game plan. Yeah. Do the biggest empire. Well, the biggest empire of the time. Yeah. Like have a little bit of a game plan. And seven years is really all it took. Right. To conquer the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire, who we mentioned, were the big bad evil guys in the Battle of Thermopylae. The richest empire in the world. Yeah. Like they had a unreal run. Yeah. Like from the Babylonian Empire to then the Persian Empire to now what it becomes eventually uh, post Alexander. Like it's a hotbed of like antiquity power. Yeah, definitely. Before he left for his campaigns, Olympias instilled the idea into Alexander's head that Philip wasn't actually his true father. He was, in fact, the son of Zeus, there immaculately conceived through Olympias. <laughs> and then Christianity was like, Wait, read that last part again? (laughs) (laughs) You're telling me there's a chance. (laughs) Wait, it's happened before? But maybe after being told this, Alexander was just like, yeah, I don't need to get married. Some woman will just like have a kid, and then I'll just claim that. (laughs) Zeus will do it again. Yeah. So with this in mind, and leading an army of over 30,000 infantry and over 5,000 cavalry, Alexander marched into Asia Minor and began to take over lands one by one. He won three major victories between the years of 334 and 331 BCE, establishing his rule over the Persian Empire as well, basically saying, I'm the Persian king now. As he went, Alexander did begin to show signs of his true ruthlessness as a leader. For example, he finally conquered the ancient island city of Tyre, and Alexander slaughtered most of the city's inhabitants and sold all of the rest of them into slavery. <laughs> yeah, 6,000 dead, and I believe 30,000 into slavery. Yeah. And, and he used incredible siege engineering. Yeah. Like the sacking and the siege of Tyre, I believe it was a, a full year. Yeah, it took him a long time. He was very dedicated to get this place. Like a year out of the seven that he... He spent a full year on this place and yeah, really he, made them pay for it. He was very frustrated by the end, I guess. Right, right. But regardless, Alexander did keep on winning. He conquered Egypt and was proclaimed once again the son of the god Zeus Amon. So he's got it from basically three people now that he's the son of a god. Zeus Amon, like Amon Ra. Yeah, like the big god names. Of, like, <laughs> ever heard of him? Like all of the gods of antiquity? Yeah. The big kicker came in 330 BCE when the Persian king Darius III was assassinated by his cousin. And at this point, Alexander declared himself true king of Asia and continued his expansion into the east. It's very interesting post this assassination, because Alexander did, I mean, despite taking all of his land, did have great respect for Darius. Yeah. And he was very upset that like he didn't get to be the one to basically kill him himself yeah he called the action against him deplorable like, yeah yeah and he if i'm not mistaken he eventually hunted down the people that did it and when i say killed them like he he killed, killed them, them. Killed them. <laughs> that's like uh when i think it was attila the hun killed an entire town and then rerouted a river to go through the person's town yeah. because he hated yeah. them so much yeah yeah, yeah. But it was also at this point that Alexander had begun to turn the tide of public opinion against himself slightly. 
He had begun to take on Persian customs and Persian dress, and one of those customs was making men kneel and kiss his hand whenever they would come into his presence, which a lot of these Macedonian soldiers and Greek soldiers weren't a big fan of. Yeah, they did not care for this. Again, the Macedonian society is traditionally very burly, very you know, hyper-masculine. They don't want to kiss someone's hand. Yeah, and you're inheriting like fighters from Athens and Sparta, so these are warrior people yeah (laughs) for the most part in conquered territories alexander did allow locals to appoint officials to rule those additions to his empire which was seen as offensive to some of the very nationalistic macedonians but don't get the wrong idea alexander wasn't just a really good guy he just knew that he didn't have the people or the know-how to rule some of these places that he was taking over so right he didn't do it for oh let's just let them like pay some taxes and then they can just do their own little thing it was very strategic yeah i believe he also let everyone keep their religion yeah i'm not mistaken they keep that that is one good thing he kept that like they could keep their language their religion that but that's why he did it he's just like Mm -hmm. you guys can rule yourselves as long as you don't get out of hand yeah then i'll come back but yeah then i'll come back and (laughs) you remember tire remember remember tire (laughs) It's just funny, like, remember Tyre and just the new system? Most people were probably thinking, what do you mean? Yeah, exactly. They're, what, did something happen? Yeah, what's a Tyre? I have family there. Yeah, oh my god. <laughs> my third cousin. At this point, the troops became uncomfortable with Alexander giving him the same status as a deity, too. I mean, people were looking at him saying he's the son of Zeus Amon, and they weren't really taking it too well, I guess. Right, and he's in his late 20s, and... Or early 30s at this point. I forget where. where this would be late here. 20s, yeah. Yeah, like our age. Yeah. <laughs> like, and I'm a god. <laughs> yeah. We have a podcast. He was basically a modern day white man with a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> We're Alexander the Great. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> yeah, kind of. And of course, the paranoia was getting just getting, it kept getting worse for Alexander because he was uncovering assassination plots against him and he had to eventually execute two men who he had once called friends. Mm-hmm. because of these assassination plots. So, already paranoid when you leave, more paranoid when you're on your own, away from your strong, supportive mother, who's, I guess, kind of instilling these facts into you. So, Right. He's feeling very godlike. It's like that classic saying of, it's very lonely at the top, and again, the culture is, you are likely to be assassinated at any point, and people will just kind of say, yeah, that." It makes sense. It was just his time to be replaced. And his mother, in letters to him, kept telling him, because he was giving huge gifts to all these people that Mm -hmm. he respected in his army and people back home. So he was giving them a bunch of money, a bunch of wealth, but he wasn't keeping any for himself. And his mom pretty much told him, you know, the more money and power you give to these people, the more reason they're going to have to try and overthrow you. And you're also not helping yourself. You're just kind of solidifying an isolation for yourself because you're sending all these people away with all this money and power right you're sending your the people that have got you to this point and your best people away from you like your inner circle away from you yeah so he was getting very lonely and this is where things truly began to unravel for alexander in 327 bce alexander did finally get married however his wife was an asian woman which in the eyes of his subordinates wasn't necessarily looked upon the most fondly After his marriage, Alexander focused on expanding into India. Some along the way submitted to the Macedonians without fighting because they knew of Alexander's reputation, but eventually Alexander did meet some real challenges, and in one fight against an Indian opponent, Alexander lost his beloved horse, Bucephalus. Because it saw a too big of a shadow. <laughs> well, they were fighting with elephants. So can you imagine how big those shadows are? Oh my goodness. <laughs> no way he's getting over that. Not a chance. They did end up winning that fight, but by that point, the Macedonian troops were very worn out and began to protest any more expansion by Alexander. So facing basically a mutiny within his ranks, Alexander did consent and split his forces and sent some back towards Babylon by sea, while the other half marched through the desert, and he was in the marching through the desert clan. (laughs) Once he got back, his army and his personal health had suffered quite a bit. 
And along the way through the desert, he realized that some of those that he had left in charge while he was on campaign had abused their power. And within the army, Macedonians were growing more and more critical of Alexander's ruling strategies as he began to put Persians in higher military positions than the Macedonians. Yes, yeah, he is very much adapting to the Persian lifestyle, like we mentioned already, taking the customs, but also, yeah, taking, but also taking positions that probably should have been going to the people that have been with them for the last decade and putting in. Uh, people that they just conquered, which in Macedonian eyes, like they were like, why? They're barbarians. We just, we just beat these. We essentially beat these people. Right. Yeah, like, exactly. And I mean, he's set up his center in Babylon now. He's not going back to Macedonia. He's pretty much solidified that he's staying in Persia. Yeah. So, I mean, he is, by all intents and purposes, Persian at this point. And then, as if to foretell things to come, Alexander's closest personal friend and second-in-command died. And at this point, it was said that Alexander was inconsolable and committed himself back to Babylon to mourn and to begin to plan out his future endeavors. But while things were disintegrating in Asia Minor, back in Macedonia, things weren't really going too much better. In his absence, Alexander had appointed his trusted general Antipater to guide Macedonia as his regent. However, he also allowed Olympias to wield some power in domestic affairs as well. And the biggest problem wasn't the fact that they were sharing the power, but rather that Alexander didn't really define their respective authorities clearly. Right. There was that gray area that these two butted heads on quite a bit. Yes, a lot. <laughs> Antipater was surely in charge of military matters, as that role was almost always designated for a male figure. But in daily affairs, it wasn't as clear-cut, and Olympias was reported as having bought grain for the kingdom in addition to probably playing roles in religious matters, which very quickly led to con a lot of controversy between the two, with Alexander's mother believing Antipater to be attempting to undermine her son's rule, while Antipater believed Olympias was exerting authority she didn't have the right to. To make things worse, Alexander officially made the decision to replace Antipater with another general towards the end of his rule, but Antipater made no effort to leave his post. Right, he got the text, but just deleted it right away. Left him on red. <laughs> Left him on red, for sure. And Cassander, who was Antipater's son, went to go visit Alexander on the battlefield to discuss the matter of his father getting cut out of the position. But according to some sources, Alexander greeted Cassander by slamming his head into a wall for laughing at the new king's Persian customs. Mm. Cassander was like, you want me to kiss your what? <laughs> yeah. So it was said that after this, Cassander couldn't even look at a statue of Alexander because he would get too scared. That's oh. how much this affected him, apparently. Oh. So it must have been pretty bad. That's very scarring. Yeah. So needless to say, this only made the relationship a little more sour. Yeah. But then, a momentous event took place that would throw literally everything into chaos. Alexander the Great died. It's not entirely certain what happened, and it has been a matter of debate for literally millennia, but at the age of 32, Alexander died after suffering from a bad fever. So it's not known whether he was simply just worn down from constant campaigning, contracted some illness, or have, as some have suggested, he was poisoned. It's really impossible to say. Alexander did drink a lot, he was constantly paranoid, and he certainly had his share of enemies. But whatever the case, Alexander was gone. Again, one of the most fast rises to power, like global at this point, you can probably consider it global power, like from Greece to India. That is a huge amount of land. Yeah, and I think he I think it was 11 or 13 years that he was officially ruler. Like if very quick yeah. from greatness to death. Like the downtrend was very fast. And again, without leaving that air, and this is a very interesting story that like on Alexander the Great's deathbed, he really wasn't able to speak naturally cuz dying. Yeah. But he handed his signet ring to his loyal commander, Perdiccas, yeah. not the one from that we mentioned before. And allegedly, this is also debated, that he whispered, or in a very low tone, said, to the best. Or to the strongest. To yeah. the strongest, yes. 
And everyone was kind of like, but who? Because he treated his generals very equally, so it really didn't stick out too much. I mean, they eventually piece it together on who, which the two sides to pick. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so as Evan just mentioned, I mean, there was so much uncertainty after yeah. he died. I mean, there was, he had no children yet mm-hmm. and he had never named who he wanted to succeed him and then when they asked him apparently he just said the strongest guy it's like what does that mean right what do does you, that leave us with do you want us to lift do you want yeah, us to right. are we doing a strongman competition yeah. here <laughs> whoever can throw the rock the farthest and because of this uncertainty and with no answers began a civil war that would last for 30 to 40 years yeah yeah, the Diodachi Wars, or Wars of the Diodachi. I think it's Diodachi, I think is how you pronounce it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Diodachi sounds like it's a... a very Italian, like Sicilian... No, it like, sounds like one of those Japanese little toys that... Oh, you want... <laughs> yeah, like a pet. Like a Tomodachi <laughs> yeah, or something. Tomodachi. Yeah. Not, not a Diodachi? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, in the days following his death, his most loyal advisors, uh, which I believe at the time numbered around seven, there's like four of them that kind of come up to be the big names eventually, but they all convened to come up with a plan. They came together in Babylon and sat down and said, we got to figure this out like fast. (laughs) Alexander, on his deathbed, had given Perdiccas, one of his closest friends, his signet ring, as Evan mentioned, and this looked to some as though Alexander intended for Perdiccas to take over. And this is where the first suggestion was made, that Alexander's wife, Roxana, was far along in her pregnancy, so why not wait until the child was born, and if the child was male, we could set up a regency until the child comes of age to rule. And this was suggested by Perdiccas, because he thought, I have the ring, I can make biggest suggestions I get some, yeah. (laughs) This is a good plan, but it left a lot to chance. First of all, would the child be a boy? Biggest question. Mm Mm-hmm. Second question, would the child even be born alive? Another big question. And third, if it was a boy and it survived the birth, would this boy be able to stay alive in such a turbulent society long enough to make it to ruling age? But that was what Perdiccas was banking on, because then he could rule as the regent for all of those years while the child grew up. Right, and establish himself, like, get himself a good piece of land. Well, this is basically how Philip got to be king. Yeah. Take over for a young boy as regent, and then you just become the guy. And then <laughs> the regents never work for the boys. No. <laughs> <laughs> but the army, uh, the mass infantry, had other ideas and didn't like the idea of waiting for this child to be born and hope that it was a boy. Because they said they already had a candidate among them in Babylon, Alexander's half brother, Philip Aridaeus. However, this was the brother that had the mental handicap and thus wasn't fit to rule. But this was a very open opportunity for the generals that they could use Philip II's other son, and with him being less competent to rule, they could use him as a puppet king and rule from behind him. The convenience that that man was in Babylon. <laughs> but you see, both sides are yeah. like, which person can we take advantage of to rule through? Right. The initial mindset isn't, let's all split up. It's, how do we gradually keep this like, yeah. intact? And then we can rule from the scenes and then split up. And I mean, they did suggest just a joint council like between all of them, pretty much, to rule as regent until the child was born. Yeah. And eventually, that's kind of what they do. But Perdiccas at the time was outnumbered, and eventually him and another general were both either killed or died, and the remaining commanders decided that they would wait for Roxana's child to be born and would bring both her and Philip Aridaeus back to Macedonia for safety for the time being. Mm -hmm. And back in Macedonia, or more specifically in Melosia, Olympias heard of her son's passing. But for Olympias, she knew that she had little time to grieve and more so needed to make a move to establish a new protection for herself. Because with Alexander being gone, she has pretty much no claim to anything anymore. Yeah, she's just a widow and childless. Yeah. Well, I guess she does have Cleopatra. Cleopatra. (laughs) (laughs) Who is married to her brother. (laughs) Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But speaking of Cleopatra, Olympias, in coordination with her daughter, began to make moves to set themselves up in new positions of power within this coming struggle. 
And one of the biggest roadblocks for them was Antipater, the guy who Alexander had set as regent while he was on campaign. First of all, Olympias and Cleopatra, well, mostly Olympias, suspected him and his sons of being responsible for Alexander's death, so they wanted to get rid of him anyways. Because, I mean, Cassander had went and visited Alexander, Cassander's younger brother was Alexander's cupbearer. It looks a little suspicious. Very, very suspicious. But Olympias and Cleopatra knew that in order to do anything, they needed male and specifically military support. Olympias did see an advantage here for them, though, because first of all, her brother was the former ruler of the Molossian homeland that she came from and was married to her daughter Cleopatra. I mean, her brother had died and Cleopatra was now a widow, but with Olympias and Cleopatra being respected in Melosia, they had some support there. And they also recognized the power pull that Cleopatra would have as a marriage partner for one of the generals fighting for power in Alexander's absence. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a pretty good look to be related to Alexander the Great. Right, the main guy, if you will. So being a widow in in this time period for her was a good a good look, but see how that goes. Yeah. And what Elizabeth Carney calls the quote brisk post Alexander elite Macedonian marriage market. Oh, that's uh, a little bit different than today's Match.com. Yeah. (laughs) Cleopatra saw very little luck trying to find a husband to support her and her her mother. Olympias found that Antipater had the same idea as her and married off his daughters to make alliances with other people that Olympias is trying to marry her daughter off to. So it was a constant back and forth of trying to break up marriage pacts. Yeah. It's a lot of strings to pull. (laughs) Yeah, very much. Especially in this time period where you're traveling quite a distance to go do anything. (laughs) Right, yeah. It's like months of travel at some point. In the end, Cleopatra never married again, and Olympias looked to other avenues for support. Antipater was now watching over the young Alexander IV, the child of Roxana, who had been born a boy. And just when Olympias was running out of options, Antipater decided to go and die, which was very convenient for her. Yeah. And, conveniently for Olympias, instead of leaving the regency to his son Cassander, Antipater left it to a man named Polyprican. This was a huge swing for Olympus, Olympias, because shortly after his appointment, Polyprican asked Olympias to return to Macedonia, whereas if Cassander got the position, he almost definitely would have tried to deal with her immediately. Cassander was just too spooked all the time because there's so many (laughs) statues of Alexander the Great. Pretty much, because everyone said, Polyprican's not a good general, Mm -hmm. but he's not as bad as Cassander. Oh, like I think it was just that Antipper didn't believe that his son had the constitution to take the position. He will soon show that he does, Mm -hmm. but I don't think his father believed in him enough. It's pretty easy to see Polyprican's motivation here. It's pretty uh, simple. Now that Antipater was gone, there was really no symbol for the Macedonian people, because when you think about it, Antipater had been in Macedonia the entire time Alexander was away. He Mm -hmm. He was a constant figure in that world of those people that live there. But without him, the only way to ensure loyalty from the people was to give them someone that they were familiar with again. I mean, they're not immediately going to take to this random general that just got a Right, like, who is this guy? So he needed someone else, and that someone else was Olympias. I mean, mother of Alexander the Great, wife of Philip II. It's a, it's a big name for the people in the common Macedonian public. Yeah, it's an easy public play there. Yeah. Because, I mean, despite this being antiquity, the public opinion still matters quite a bit. Yeah. Like, we see that happen a lot in Rome. Like in our Roman stories, but we cover like the PR aspect of especially Nero and his mother. Public opinion does matter. A lot, yeah. And this is very dangerous for Olympias. I mean, she's taking herself, uh, her daughter doesn't come with her, but like her newborn grandson is there. They're all pretty much in a nest of vipers now, mm. being surrounded by all of these people that want to take them out to get the power plays. And they're not Olympias's vipers. No. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not her bed snakes. No, <laughs> can you? Man? No, these are my bed snakes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those aren't my fighting snakes. Yeah, but now it was Olympias and Polyprican against Cassander and his new companion, another strong woman who is entering the story, named Adea Eurydice or a day Eurydice, had married Philip Eridaeus, the puppet king by all intents. 
So with him, Adea gained support of not only the army who supported Philip's claim to the throne, but also found an ally in Cassander. So she gets very powerful very quickly. And she's right. like 17. Yeah. So Adea Eurydice becomes very th- a very big thorn in Olympias' side trying to get into a position of power. What a move. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to go marry that guy. Yeah. That nobody believes could be king. That no one believes but can be king. But he's got a lot of people behind him. Right. Like, it's very important to have the army behind you. Yeah. <laughs> but both Olympias and Adea Eurydice were... On a clock, because Olympias was, she was just old. I mean, she was in her late 50s at this point, which is pretty old for this time period. And Adea faced the different problem of the fact that in her five years of marriage, they still had no child. Mm -hmm. And if Alexander IV, who is Alexander the Great's son, grew up long enough without her having a child, she had no claim to the throne and that kid was going to take over. So Mm -hmm. she was on a clock too. But... At this point, a series of events led to one of the most fantastic stories in the entire saga of the fight for succession after Alexander dies. Two armies, one led by Olympias and the other led by the young Adea Eurydice, or Eurydice, I'm going to say Eurydice, met on the battlefield. And in, in the words of Dan Carlin, this is where Olympias channeled the power of ghosts. And I will explain that in a second. <laughs> According to reports, Adea Eurydice walked out at the head of her forces dressed as a soldier, wearing armor, and appearing as one of the common ranks, leading the men. However, Olympias chose a different approach. She dressed as a follower of Dionysus, however that might have looked, but she wore no armor and played upon her religious role within the Macedonian and ancient Greek society. So I guess you can kind of envision this however you really want to. You can yeah. just see her and wearing like a robe or whatever. I don't know. And when the two met on the battlefield, it's, it's pretty incredible because the forces of Adea Eurydice, upon seeing the wife of Philip II and the mother of Alexander the Great, once again, this is where she channels ghosts, all of these men laid down their arms and defected to Olympias' side without fighting. That is so funny. But also, what a power play. That is like, incredible. <laughs> using, I mean, she had to be extremely charismatic. Yeah. Like, the, well, mount, she, the presence that she had in the yeah, culture. I like, mean, th- I don't know what Dan Carlin's way of putting it is the best way to put it. Like, she channeled ghosts. Yeah. She used the power of her former husband and former son, well, dead son, dead husband. Mm-hmm. And she knew that the people would respect her for that. And, and the fact that she's still playing on that religious role that she would have had normally right yeah it's it's pretty incredible i can't imagine seeing all of your troops leave you bye <laughs> bye <laughs> and also right away after this olympias walls up philip Aridaeus and a day Eurydice, and shortly after has them killed Ooh, most likely yeah. having philip stabbed and then once again having a day hang herself so yeah it's a very quick transition from power play to death yeah Olympias then went on to supposedly kill Cassander's younger brother, who was, as I mentioned, Alexander the Great's former cupbearer, along with about 100 members of the Macedonian upper classes. And this, for obvious reasons, enraged Cassander. Yeah. <laughs> she just killed his brother. And anyone who may have been inclined to support Cassander because they liked his father Antipater probably shifted to support Cassander fully after these events. I mean, she's just killing people. And after this, Cassander abandoned his campaign in the Greek South States, and up, he marched north pretty much intent on just getting to Olympias. So he fought through and around Polyprican's forces, going directly towards Olympias, besieging the city where she was, and eventually she gave herself up under the promise of safety to Cassander. Cassander organized a trial for Olympias, And this is where the accounts kind of begin to diverge on what exactly happens, because either the trial happened or it didn't happen. But regardless, Cassander began to fear that if Olympias made too many public appearances, they, the public might see her again and start, she might just have that influence. Channel the ghosts. Yeah. And channel the ghosts again. He began to fear that influence and took steps to take care of her for good. Most reports say that he sent soldiers to kill Olympias, but upon seeing her, these soldiers turned around and left, once again, channeling ghosts. 
So at this point, Cassander sent the family members of those that Olympias had killed, and uh, they stabbed her. Yeah, you can't you can't rely on guards in this case. No. Like her power, her presence, her aura is just way too strong for yeah. a common guard to do some stabbing. And the stabbing, her death was pops, possibly public too. Mm. So. She, in all accounts, she did not die a normal woman's death at this time period, but rather she died the death of basically a male hero being stabbed to death publicly. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of reports say that she died even like another report I saw was that she died a soldier's yeah. death. So it's a very unwomanly end to her life, but yeah. it's it's very fitting for her. Quite the I mean you I don't want to say commend because yeah, she did kill like a hundred yeah, plus she, people. No, she was ruthless. But you got <laughs> you got to respect the game a little bit. Yeah. After a few years, Cassander eventually killed Roxana and Alexander the Fourth as well, and seeked to establish his title as ruler. And while all this was happening, the rest of the major generals in Asia were still fighting for power. One of them, named Ptolemy, had stolen Alexander's body and taken it to Egypt with him, where it pretty much remained. And then these successors began to infight for years with alliances being made and broken until eventually each of the major participants claimed sections of Alexander's once great unified empire and divided it amongst themselves. Yeah, the stealing of the body was bizarre. It's a wild story. Yeah, he, I believe it was, being tran- well, it was being transported to Macedonia to a special tomb, but then Ptolemy was like, yunk. It's mine like, now. <laughs> so you're, but uh, then Olympias gets deprived of ever seeing her son again. And yep. like, it's, a very, it's a very weird move. Right. And to claim that this body gave you power, like more standing in these upcoming alliances these upcoming wars it's like to say that you're supposed to be the ruler he's just weekend at burning this corpse oh God, <laughs> to try and say he's the her. ruler <laughs> but these four wars would usher in the next period of ancient history known as the hellenistic period that evan mentioned towards the top of the episode and this would last until rome conquered the last of its holdouts in egypt so in summary Alexander the Great may be the focus of this period of history, but in my opinion, it is the people that surround him who really deserve attention. Because there's a reason for Alexander's title being the Great, and it is a well-deserved title. However, without Philip and Olympias, Alexander almost certainly wouldn't have been set up as well as he was to inherit the Macedonian kingdom. After all, his father revolutionized the society in Greece and united the warring tribes, while his mother exercised influence and political presence never seen, or at least not recorded, until she came along. And without any of those three to keep it together, Alexander's empire quickly fell apart. And that was the end. The end of Alexander the Great. Like, what a family. Like, those three people, yeah. those three individuals had such an effect on the world that we know today. And like you mentioned, up until Rome came in, this was an insanely large empire. Yeah, and it was constant fighting after he for 300 years, pretty much. Right, right. I mean, the Ptolemaic kingdom, which was just Egypt, constantly fighting the Seleucid kingdom, which yeah. was what Persia used to be. Yeah, and then you've got the Cassandroma, I think yeah. is what it's called, kingdom, where Cassander rules now. and. What a funny name of a kingdom. Yeah. It's like, who rules there? Cassander. Cassander. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, th- that is what we are calling our coverage of Alexander. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. I, it's, I think this is a lot better way to do it than to just go names and what wars happen. Right. I mean, if you want to get in-depth visual and, I guess, just learn more about the battles themselves. I mean, there's plenty of YouTube. Oh, yeah. Where they like actually have visual effects? Yeah, <laughs> I think we've tried on the show every which way to make battles sound dramatic and interesting. Yeah, we, on this audio format, it's very hard. We decided not to do that. <laughs> like it's it's just kind of like uh right. And then this person stabbed this person, and then they flanked, and then yeah, that's it's just tough. Like in the case of Hannibal, we'll talk about specific battles because yeah. he reformed military structure with right. what he did, but. <laughs> In like this case, I don't think it's as important as what the major players did while everything was going on. Right, so, right, right. Yes. But 
That is Alexander the Great from the side. <laughs> from the side, Good yes. side profile. <laughs> Great side profile. It's on a lot of coins. It is. But if you want to continue the conversation with us, uh, you can visit us on our Patreon, which we recently launched. You can find us at Gems of History Podcast on Patreon. Uh, we currently have one tier, uh, just $5 a month where you can get early access to episodes. You can get a sticker that we will ship to you and some other cool benefits. Yeah, it's five a month, 60 a year. What's What else is 60 a year? A couple rounds of golf, you know? A round at this point. <laughs> Depending on where you're going, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't think it's that much of an ask. Yeah, yeah, you know, help me. Buy, help, please help the wedding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at Gems. What is our Twitter? Gems underscore, underscore history. history. Wow. <laughs> you gone two weeks. In yeah. Uh, you can follow Jacob at Jacob from Wisco, myself at what Evskis, and then you can find us on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. And that's it at Gems of History Podcast. <laughs> And Facebook uh, at the Agora <laughs> Gems of History Podcast. That was, was a the roughest a social media read of all time. <laughs> My we, goodness. We got there eventually. We, that was a social media read from the side. <laughs> from the side. <laughs> but yes, thank you guys all for listening. I, I think when, I, when this episode comes out, I'll probably start asking for listener suggestions on our Patreon for this month's episode so that we can get ahead on that. So yeah, if you are a part of our Patreon, you can go look for that. And I think that's all we really got for you guys this week. So until next week, everyone, take care of yourselves, love each other because we love you, and stay polished.